Good morning, everyone. My name is Eliane Furer. I'm part of the malaria vaccine team at WHO in Geneva in the, as part of the immunization department. And I've been asked to um, just share a few slides to share our experience with developing a framework for the allocation of limited malaria vaccine supply. I was just listening to the, the sessions this morning, and it does sound like we are in a quite similar situ situation in terms of um, uh, supply and demand imbalance. So I'll, I'll walk you through how we are trying to deal with the situation for the malaria vaccine. So to start with, just um, in terms of a bit of a background, so the malaria vaccine, the first malaria vaccine was recommended for broader use by WHO about a year ago. And um, the vaccine is called RTSS. Uh, the first available worldwide. And this vaccine is now recommended to be used for the prevention of P. falciparum malaria in children living in regions with moderate to high transmission. The vaccine requires four doses per child and um, the schedule starts in children from five months of age. It's an injectable vaccine, intramuscular, and uh, has the usual storage temperature between two to eight degrees. So we do expect for this vaccine, um, a vaccine supply shortage in the initial years. The demand uh, we expect to be quite high. We have over 20 countries that have already expressed an interest to Gavi uh, in introducing the vaccine. On an annual basis, there are over 25 million children born in areas where ma malaria is a, a problem and where the vaccine could add benefit. So overall, we expect demand could potentially reach more than 80 to 100 million doses per year. In terms of supply, we currently only have one product available produced by one manufacturer. This manufacturer committed um, through UNICEF to provide 18 million doses over the next three years. A share of um, this available supply is um, safeguarded for three countries that started to use the vaccine as part of a pilot program in 2019. So some, some doses will be allocated to ensure continued vaccination services in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. So as you can see from these numbers, we have a quite severe supply constraint in the, in the beginning. So WHO was asked to develop a mechanism to allocate the limited supply in a fair, transparent way. And I will show you how, how this was done. But um, before we go into the details, I, I want to highlight a few of the differences that we might be facing just for, for, for awareness, because the mechanism that you may choose to apply for cholera vaccine may be slightly different um, than, than for other vaccines or, or the malaria vaccine. So in our case, the malaria vaccine, um, Gavi support is for delivery via the routine program. Um, so there will be a recurrent need year by year once we start in a certain area. My understanding from your discussion is that the cholera vaccine delivery via preventative campaigns would be um, uh, limited in time, potentially to be repeated, but delivery through campaigns. For the malaria vaccine, we will be starting with a single age cohort. So for example, all children that are nine months of age at a particular point in time, uh, I understand that for cholera, this would uh, be multi-age, quite large campaigns. I mentioned the schedule, four doses for the malaria vaccine. The first doses are four weeks apart. And then there's a fourth dose that will have to be given 12 to 18 months after the third dose. So there's a a quite long time commitment also in terms of an individual child. Um, in terms of the burden, malaria is concentrated regionally. The highest burden is in Sub-Saharan Africa. I understand for cholera, the, the burden is um, uh, not focused only on, on Africa, but other parts of the world. For malaria, um, we don't have a stockpile, so there's no allocation for outbreak response. I understand for cholera, um, this may complicate a little bit your supply situation because there will be some supply that needs to be safeguarded for outbreak response. So this may create some additional uncertainty regarding what is available for preventive campaigns. And then finally, a key difference for the malaria vaccine. For this vaccine, we do not expect any herd protection or herd immunity. So it's mainly about individual protection. While if I correctly understand for the cholera vaccine, there is quite considerable herd protection. 
So with these differences in mind, um, uh, I can now talk about the uh, the choice that's what, that was made for the malaria vaccine in terms of allocation. We started the process at the beginning of this year by looking at other allocation mechanism um, with an aim to learn from the past experience. And of course, the COVID-19 situation has generated quite a lot of um, debate and discussion about allocation of limited resources. And um, our starting point was a discussion with the WHO Working Group on Ethics and COVID-19, because we wanted to learn from from their um, reflections on, on fair allocation of COVID-19 products. And what we learned was quite interesting. So they, they have produced a number of different um, documents um, that might also be useful documents for, for your purpose. Um, but one resonated quite well with us, where they said that um, there are many different ways to allocate limited resources, but the choice um, essentially reflects what is being valued most. And science or evidence alone cannot tell you which choice or aim is correct, but it really needs um, society or stakeholders to express their views on what is being valued most. And so as a, as a consequence, in a way, there's no, um, there's no single best scientific response necessarily, but it depends on what stakeholders value, value most. And so as a first step, it is important to um, solicit the values and ethical considerations by those affected by the decisions. And so um, with this input, we developed a, a process to develop the mechanism, recognizing that the, the process is probably as important as the final outcome. And this diagram shows that the process that we, we choose to apply. So we first um, did a number of uh, analytical work and reviews in terms of um, um, how much vaccine might be needed and, and where the, uh, the highest burden areas are. We then um, convened a group of external experts. Those were senior experts in malaria and immunization and ethics and human rights, and some members with experience from the pilot implementation also some representation by the um, Afro-Regional Immunization Technical Advisory Group, by SAGE, by MPAC, which is uh, the malaria equivalent, um, to really have a representative group of uh, independent experts to help us develop the framework. We had a series of meeting, meetings with, with these experts, and I should say they were predominantly from the African continent. Um, they helped us develop a draft framework with the key principles for allocation, which we then submitted to a quite broad stakeholder consultation. We organized a series of webinars where different um, types of stakeholders were asked to uh, give us feedback on that draft. So we included um, program managers from affected countries, NITAC members, um, civil society and community organizations, and global stakeholders and partners and donors and got really good feedback on, on, on the proposed mechanism. We then brought back the, the, the feedback and inputs to the advisors um, and they helped us finalize the, the framework. And so by um, approximately five to six months later, we had a, a final framework available that we are now using to, to help inform allocation decisions. So this slide shows the, the set of principles. So we defined some governance principles in terms of how the framework was developed and how it should be applied. And then here in blue are the key allocation principles. So how the supply will be managed. And what I highlighted here is that the first order principle, um, it was felt it was important that this vaccine should be allocated first to countries for use in areas where the need is greatest. So the need was expressed as um, where the malaria disease burden in children and the risk of death are highest. And what this principle means in practice is that um, we wouldn't allocate um, vaccine supply to meet the, the needs of the entire country, but um, each country will have to identify the areas of greatest need within its own borders. And then we'll have to have a, a way of being able to compare across countries so that we allocate the limited supply really to those 
areas in greatest need across the, the continent um, for those countries that are interested in, in applying um, for the vaccine. And then there are a couple of other considerations in terms of um, ensuring continuity, uh, reducing wastage and, and so on. And, um, and one fundamental value of solidarity has been kind of woven into all the different principles and, and how the framework will be applied. But in practice, it also means that initially when supply is very limited, um, it was felt that it, it was important that a larger number of countries have initial access to this vaccine. So this solidarity principle implies that initially no single country can get more than 20% um, of globally available supply. And so this together with the greatest need principle ensures that um, we, we sprinkle supply uh, across a, a larger number of countries. And so the, um, the first principle, so the, the allocation to areas of greatest need requires um, an analysis at country level of where these greatest need areas are. And we suggest for the malaria vaccine to use a combined indicator of um, parasite prevalence and under five mortality rates. So each country will have to use these two indicators or proxy measures for these two indicators in order to establish uh, stratification of the areas of need within its own borders and then establish categories uh, like the ones shown here where for example, the, the dark purple shows the greatest need areas. And as you can see, these are combinations of very, very high malaria parasite prevalence levels and very, very high under five mortality rates. And in a limited supply situation, countries would be asked to start with these greatest need areas. And then as more supply becomes available to expand routine vaccination use to other areas going down this list. And um, in order to ensure cross-country comparability, we ask each country to, um, to the extent possible, use its own local data, but um, apply these same thresholds. So this allows um, a better comparability across countries. And then to illustrate how this may play out, we used globally available data to um, um, establish a, a table where we show the, the number of children born each year in these different categories. Each country will ultimately go through this exercise and may come up with different numbers, but this table helps us to um, orient countries in their initial um, uh, choices, because for some countries, they may identify these areas and say, well, this is not a, a, a meaningful first introduction, so we prefer to wait until more supply becomes available. For other countries, um, they may appreciate the initial learning with a small scale introduction, but ultimately each country will have to take that decision uh, on its own. Then um, uh, um, we notice that some countries have very large areas of highest need. For example, DRC, more than 2 million children are born in these highest need areas. And so this country alone could potentially use up all available supply. And so therefore we had to include a, a solidarity principle so that no single country can get more than approximately 20% of available supply. So in practice, this means in our situation um, that no country will initially be able to get more than 1 million doses uh, per year. And so this is a, an additional safeguard so that more countries can come forward initially. So the practical implications for countries is that um, the framework doesn't include, uh, doesn't exclude a country, so there's no a priori list of eligible or uneligible countries, but each country will have to consider a phased approach to vaccine implementation, starting with those highest need areas uh, and expansion when supply increases. So each country will have to go through this um, stratification analysis. The framework clarifies the allocation principle, but it doesn't remove all the uncertainties. For example, there is no fixed envelope set aside for each country. Um, each country will have to look at its stratification and, um, and take a decision based on that. There's also an element um, of uncertainty linked to the outcome of the Gavi Independent Review Committee. So we would apply the allocation 
only to those applications that have successfully passed through the GAVI ISC process. This also means that um, the, whether or not a country gets an allocation depends how many countries come forward in a particular allocation round, how many other countries are interested. And there's a bit of uncertainty at the moment on that. And then also we, we are facing, I think as you do, some uncertainties about when exactly more supply will become available. And to the extent possible, we try to be very transparent with, with the principles and with what is available and engage in a dialogue with countries to um, help them with the, with the planning. So in conclusion, from our experience, uh, I think we can say there's, there's no single best or true solution for the allocation, but the, the process of how the mechanism is developed is probably as important as the final mechanism in order to increase acceptance and understanding. The adherence by all stakeholders is really important. So you want to make sure that everyone um, involved can really um, stick to that same mechanism. So that means the, the affected countries and communities, but also the, the manufacturers, the founders, um, and the implementing partners. We made sure that we designed the mechanism in a dynamic way so that we can deal with changes in the supply and demand um, situation over time. And then very important, I think we, we are now in the process of um, starting to apply the, the mechanism and uh, explaining this to countries. We see that it's very important to be extremely transparent, um, listen out for um, for, for, for needs to explain the mechanism further, what it means in practice, and really reinforce communication around um, the supply situation to manage the expectations uh, properly. So I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.